And if Putin will lose, come from your heated, well-built, nice house in the center of Kiev, and after a few hours, you're already a beggar. People killed in the cars. Putin has to defend because NATO is expanding, which is totally not true. Basically, I would say the Russians are lying. The real battle was Ostomel, and the Russian plan failed there. Ukraine is like a kind of avant-garde of uh, our resistance. This is a European war. My name is Lorenzo Cremonesi. I write for the Italian, major Italian daily newspaper Corriere della Sera, which is the oldest daily in Italy. It was founded more than 150 years ago. I'm 65 years old in a month, and I'm working for this newspaper since when I was very young, just after the university. So it's now 40 years, more than 40 years that I'm working for this paper. And I study philosophy, and since I was, when I was very young, uh, I started to be a journalist. I, like, I have a grandfather who was a journalist, and I've been 20 years correspondent in Jerusalem, since uh, from the early 80s till 2000, 2001. And then I've been, of course, at the time a lot in the Middle East, a lot in Lebanon. At the time, the, the Israeli-Palestinian question was really the central question of the Middle East. And then, of course, I cover Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. And I was in Ukraine. I came in Ukraine in uh, 2014 for the event Maidan and after Maidan. I followed, the, I remember in particular, the Balsevo fight. And at the time, for us, Western journalists, it was still possible to cross. Uh, I came to Kiev, but then I went also to Donetsk. I went to the so-called uh, autonomous region. Uh, and I remember covering, in particular, the, the tragic event, the shooting down Air Malaysian airplane uh, with a lot of civilians killed, there were almost 300, a lot of children. And that was a particular story because I found out there was a local uh, pro-Russian soldier who openly told me they shot it down. So I was called also the international trail. I was kind of a witness, a testimony, my experience there. Ukrainian scenario by the European press, but also I think in general by the international press, was more or less forgotten, was not taken seriously, was seldomly followed. If I look back on this last year before 24 of February, if I look back at the last eight years, I remember few moments in which the story came out to, and came back to our attention. The first one which came onto my mind is, for instance, the catch crisis in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, when the Russians built the bridge, closed the Azov Sea, and even took some of the two or three Ukrainian boats. Uh, I remember I came, I went to Mariupol, and there was a bit of flurry of attention, uh, a wave of, of, of articles, of stories. But then again, the story went down. The easy way in which the Russians got uh, Crimea, so the idea was that uh, Ukraine was somehow defending itself, it was not a real army, it was uh, still the kind of um, beginning of a kind of army, there was no comparison between the strength of the two. It was more a kind of army of volunteer, the story of the Azov battalion came out uh, very often. In this case, the Russian propaganda was very strong, Neo we mean not neo-Nazi, but uh, extreme uh, nationalist with neo-Nazi value, the Zvastika story came out many, many times. There was a kind of suspicious, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainian resistance. I would say that in Italy, in particular, having this long, strong relation of, between Italy and Russia, this is a chapter in itself, which is interesting because Italy you know, Europe is similar, but it's composed by different states with different stories, different elements. So uh, there was a lot of sympathy for the Russian too. 
and a lot of attention to the Donetsk uh, Donbass people, to the reason of the uh, independentists, the pro-Russian. We are journalists following the story from the other side, and Russian welcoming them. The Russian army and the Ukrainian resistance composed of ambiguous elements, let's say. That's why when uh, the Russian attack, the Russian invasion happened, in Europe in general, and Italy in particular, the idea was in one day the Russian will win. The Russian will take over. That was the general perception from the little journalist, young newcomer, to the big commentator, to the politician, to the historian. The idea was Russian will win in no time. And I remember the first of March was the first, that means six days after the beginning of the Russian, seven days, one week after the beginning of the Russian invasion, I wrote, I called my editor in chief in, in Milano and I told him we should write a story, kind of a comment, with a question mark. And if Putin will lose, I mean, change the narrative. Maybe it's not so easy. Maybe it's not so clear. It's not so impossible that the Ukrainian will resist and will even take over, will be able to resist. And that, wow, impossible, you're crazy, you understand nothing. The paper told me, this time you don't cover Ukraine. That was told by Correa della Sera in Milano. And I tell you, on the 26th of February, I was supposed to go to Somalia for a story of, uh, of February. For the Western world, talking about media commentator, there were two kind of preconceptions. First, if Russian attack will win. Second, Russia will not attack. The narrative was it's only a bluff. The Americans are the usual warmonger. They understand nothing. They failed in Afghanistan. They failed in Iraq. And look, they, will not under they don't understand that Putin is bluffing. And I myself, I was dubious. But I told, let me go. In I, I will cost you 2,000 euros. I go there, I go in a hotel, let others write. If something happened, I am there. And they told me, no, you don't go. So when they called me, I was taken by surprise, and I came. I just tell you the story. I try, there was a flight to, to, to Warsaw and to come in by, by car and then from um, uh, Lviv. But that day, the Moldavian airspace was closed. And I remember, I went to Venice because there was a local flight to go to Moldavia, and the flight was closed. So I went back to uh, Milano, and I took a flight to Warsaw, to Poland. And I remember calling my editor in the car, because I went there and then back, was five or six hours in the, in the car, telling him, you see, it's already Europe. Moldavian airspace is closing. You are talking about Europe, a NATO country. For me, it was extremely difficult from Lviv to come to Kiev. The train were in total confusion. And it, was no, it was very cold, it was snowing. I don't know if you were here, but it was really tough. And then I found a young guy who took me by car. And I had to arrive here when there was the maximum attempt by the Russian to enter. I didn't know that. We, we entered under shelling what, from the road. We had to leave the major motorway from Leopoli because the motorway itself was bombed. I saw bodies of uh, people killed in the cars. I was called by my newspaper talking about the situation right now in the early morning uh, of the attack of the Russian aggression and that was about five o'clock. It was, they called me at six, one hour later, and they asked me to come. And then I came. Ci colleghiamo subito con Lorenzo Cremonesi, naturalmente eh, priorità assoluta, perché Lorenzo, buongiorno, dove ti trovi intanto? Buongiorno, io oggi mi trovo a Kiev, qui in un albergo vicino, anzi davanti a piazza Maidan, quindi nel, nel centro della, della capitale, dove sono arrivato ieri e ho potuto proprio ieri sera tra l'altro, poche ore fa e ho potuto da, arrivando da Leopoli quindi facendo tutta la pa dalla parte occidentale a Kiev 
e ho potuto vedere gli effetti di questo progressivo assedio che si stringe, questo laccio che letteralmente si stringe al collo di Kiev, perché noi sappiamo che i russi ormai controllano tutto il, ner- il nord, l'est e l'ovest. I was thinking there will be a partisan war. That was what I was thinking. There will be a resistance inside Russian lines, inside Russian occupied territory. Non dimentichiamo che la città come si prepara è la resistenza. E veramente ci sono migliaia e migliaia di volontari con effetti che, avendolo visto in tanti altri luoghi del mondo, compreso l'Iraq e l'Afghanistan, qui sono stati armati tutti, tutti quelli che vogliono combattere. E quindi c'è gente che le armi non le sa usare. They were um, self-organized committee of people resisting with hunting gun, not with, um, low, uh, with machine gun, with hunting gun, with old First World War pistols to defend themselves. And I say, they will organize. They will. But my, my, I consider obvious that the Russians would have taken Kiev. And my first concern, I remember I didn't know even where to go. Many journalists were leaving, many journalists were escaping. You know what I was doing, basically? I was going around, I went to Com- uh, Co- Kozaski Hotel here in, in, uh, in Maidan, and I found a place. I didn't know, I just went there because I remember it was, I didn't know, the, but then I, I discovered that Kiev was much more alive and well organized than I thought. You know, when you enter in a war situation, you always think the worst. Then you discover people who leave, children. I mean, there is a normal life, but it takes time. And they, of course I would worry. And uh, I remember that I was looking for food and a place with a generator. Because when you are in war, the generator, you need electricity. I'm not a tourist, I need to send my stories. I found a, a person from, who spoke Italian by chance, by poor luck, walking in the street, and he offered me a place where to sleep. So I said, okay, I, have, I will have an emergency refuge. The Russian will enter, I, will have, I can hide. So that was my attitude. It took me, as I told you, till the 1st of March, when I realized that, first of all, yeah, there was a very large resistance movement, that if the Russian would have entered physically in Kiev, would have been a bloodshed, barricades, Molotov cocktail, was serious. But I was expecting a huge war in the city. And something else happened, and this is a kind of lack of a unfortunate. <laughs> uh, I was shopping, literally, uh, near Maidan. I found there was a little supermarket open. Very few people were going around. And I had to buy, I took, I took uh, food in can, canned food, I took, you know, bread, uh, water bottle. And there was a guy who was a colonel in the air defense units who just got on pension last year and he had a lot of friends and that was I think was about the, the last day of February was 28th or the 1st of March and he told me the story of Ostomel which we didn't know and he told me hey wait a second I tell you what happened and I believe him he looked very he gave me circumstance there was some rumor about the Ostomel battle but there were still rumors and he told me all the story he told me hey they are not entering we defeat the, the first battle of the real battle was Ostomel and the Russian plan failed there. Putin wanted to take Kiev in a few hours, he couldn't. And now it's another war. He failed the first operation, which was to capture Kiev with, um, you know, with special squad, a special unit. And I, this guy gave me all the detail, which unit, how many soldiers, you know, that's the three Ilyushin, 76. Air, airplane transport troops, which were shot down in the air or on the ground, and they lost about 600 soldiers. The first few hours, these soldiers were one to suppose to arrive in Kiev, to join with a local uh, sleeping cell, kill Zelensky, and take the city. But when this plan failed, the Russians didn't have a plane B. It took me about a week, but then I understood this point. That's why I called my paper. And that's what happened in, in those first days. And then I thought, it's another war. And I thought, that makes sense of what I see on the ground. Because there was a story coming out from the local forces 
the, the, you remember the famous convoy? There is a Russian convoy, 60 km, 60 km convoy means I don't know how many vehicles. Which is, and he never arrived. And there was a story without talking with the, with the local soldier of very agile little Ukrainian unit with the Javelin uh, and the Luau missiles attacking them on the flank. And for me it was clear that something went wrong. The Russians were not coming in. There are two main elements in this war which make some difference with the previous war. The first one, this is a, mainly a conventional war. So the last war which I really followed as a conventional war was the beginning of the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. It was the beginning because the real war was not uh, during the invasion, the months of the invasion between uh, March and April 2003, but was the guerrilla war after which was mainly terrorism, non-conventional forces, was standing army against group of guerrilla. Here we have mainly a conventional war. We have standing army, the Russian army, organized, I would say, Second World War army, uh, against the Ukrainian army. Of course there are many volunteers, but all these volunteers are organized as an, like, as an army. The second element which characterizes the, the war in, uh, in Ukraine is that, and that I would say is the most important element for us, for me as a European, as an Italian, is that this is a European war. European had this illusion, this Western European had this illusion. Uh, namely that the war was something which didn't affect us. It was something for primitive people from the Middle East, from Afghanistan, Pakistan. But we were clean. The war was en ended in 1945 and thank God we had NATO, we had the international organization. So the war didn't concern us. If the war doesn't concern us, the main idea was that if you are advanced and civilized person or, per, or you have a, a diplomatic apparatus, you have a state organized, then you can solve conflict with dialogue, with negotiation, with diplomacy. We were living in a world which was not real because America had this umbrella protecting us and because the power of force, the rule, the primitive rule of war was always there. Violence was all around us, we just, we simply didn't want to look at. Attack by Putin proved my point that the rule of force, the power of a nation which decide with, the, with an army to invade another one just simply because it feels, it thinks it's stronger, is still there. And we have to learn how to defend ourselves. That's why I really look at this Ukrainian resistance, kind of a teaching lesson, like a, 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 a place, a situation which you have to look at and learn a lot. That's why I consider Ukraine like a kind of avant-garde of uh, our resistance and uh, a place where we have to learn how to think back our conception, our vision, our situation, our position in the world. and to learn that in order to, if you have value, as I think we have, democracy, freedom, freedom of the press, I believe very much as a journalist in freedom of the press, then you have to be ready to defend it also with guns, also with violence. You have two situations which, you know, one looked like 10 years ago, but is one year ago, very recent, Afghanistan, which I follow thoroughly last year and here. The Afghans, who uh, were our allies, we, after 2001, we tried to recreate Afghanistan, the Afghani army. Italian were there. We had a big contingent. There was some moment in which Italy had 5,000 soldiers in Afghanistan with weapons, with organization, and uh, they failed. They were defeated. I think we have a big responsibility in that. Afghan girls cannot go to school. Afghan women have to cover themselves. 
Afghan men have to have beard and to have to have the shawar khamis, the local uh, dresses. There is a theocracy, very dangerous, for, and, and terrorism is going back. The Afghan didn't send themselves, didn't die for their freedom, or not enough, and the result is slavery. It's a situation which many of them are trying not to escape, and dangerous for the world. Here, U Ukrainians are resisting. They are defending their freedom. They are defending their liberties, in independence. The social media, internet, the quick way of communication, the new way of communication, the globalization, it's a factor. Also in positive way, I tell you something, I, let's talk about something different. The Syrian scenario, which has to do with Ukraine, by the way, but uh, the Syrian scenario, uh, Bashar Assad, the father of Hafez, in uh, 1981, killed, uh, the, the number is always not precise, between 15, 10, 15, even till 30,000 people in Hama, the famous Hama massacre. And the Hama massacre, remember Thomas Friedman, who was my colleague in Jerusalem, and he was before me in Beirut, writing a book and article about that when two or three months later, in the early 80s came out that uh, Bashar al-Assad killed so many people who were so connected to the fundamentalists in Syria. Today something like that could not happen, and Ukraine could not happen. I mean the social media can be confusing, can be, but at one point you know that something happened because it came out, you have images, you have stories. If the Russians are going to kill 10,000 people in Kherson, at one point it, it came out. It, once it was, it was possible to cover it up, or maybe to know it 20 years later, but not now. So you have to follow what happened, and of course you can fake it up. You can take a picture of a situation, put it in, in one, and say it's Kherson, and, and instead it's Bakhmut, but still, you can, you know, you can work on it. At the beginning, the real point for me was that the Russians were lying. And that came, and I used to say, I say that many times at the beginning. Russia, uh, Putin told us, as I was saying before, till really few hours before, till the famous speech when he said he was coming here to free the, the poor uh, Ukrainian from the Nazi, but till the famous speech, of course he wrote the famous article last year in, in July, but that was an article and it was not taken so much ser seriously. But till few hour, till few days, he claimed that they were not, they would have not, there would have not been an, an invasion. They were doing just um, training with the Belorussia, and they were moving this troop. But there the was all the um, when when he did it, I say, this is a lie. Putin is lying, and we have to be very careful. As when, at the end of the month, clearly he lost the Battle of Kiev because it was a big defeat for the Russians, and he started claiming, no, 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 we never wanted to take Kiev, we just wanted to go to the, the Donbass. Which was also wrong. Somehow in good faith on this, on this point was that Zelensky himself and Biden criticized Zelensky saying, you see, we told you, and, and he told him you are not ready because it's true, the Ukrainians were thinking something big in Donbass, an enlargement of the occupation, maybe going to the border of the Donbass, that's it. They were not thinking. They're not imagining something. So I say, okay, here there's an aggressor who is lying, and a, 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 a victim who had been aggressed, who had been attacked, who were not ready. So when the Russian talk about provocation, etc., it's all bullshit because it's no provocation. It's the Russian who are lying and they want to attack and they look for a casus belli, as you say in Latin, a pretext to attack, as it is now for the dirty bomb and many other, I don't have to, all, all the story of the dam uh, on, the, on the Dnieper River, etc. So basically, I would say the Russians are lying. In Italy, there was, after the war, the Second World War, the strongest communist party in Europe, in Western Europe. Italian Communist Party was almost winning the elections in 1946. That's very important. The Italian Communist Party was historically, culturally, deeply connected with Russia. Italian culture, Italian fashion, Italian way of living was very much liked and, 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 and they were around in Russia. 
different very famous Italian artists are still going to, to Russia to perform. So this is one element. Uh, the second element, which is also very much entrenched, very much uh, deeply connected to the European and the uh, Italian uh, it intellectual elite, is the anti-Americanism. There is an anti-American feeling which is hard to believe, it's hard to comprehend, it's difficult to comprehend, but it's still there. This idea that Putin is trying to spread, which was spread, and it was an argument of the interview I had just two days ago with Zelensky, Berlusconi, in the parliament, three days ago, Berlusconi is now a senior member of the new Italian government, repeating, as Zelensky told me, repeating the same wording, the same sentence of Putin. We are attacking because Zelensky attacked us because didn't keep the war, didn't keep the, the, the agreements, so we have to defend ourselves. Berlusconi repeated it that in openly in the parliament with some of members of his uh, party and it was recorded and it became a big scandal. And this somehow accepted. So this idea, this is not a Russian invasion, but it's an American organized plot to weaken Russia. Another idea which is very well spread in, in Italy and in the West. Putin has to defend because NATO is expanding, which is totally not true. Totally not true. NATO was so weak in the last years, they, didn't, they lost their raison d'etre. It was Putin which rebuilt the raison d'etre of, of, of NATO. The reason to be in, it, to be strong, because Russia, Russia is back. Otherwise NATO was dismantling, was vanishing. Trump was right, Donald Trump was, was right to ask to the, uh, to the partner in Europe, you want to keep NATO, pay money, participate to expenses. Italy spent less than 2% with his own defense and all the rest. Is, now Germany decided to rearm and is creating problems with French, with France, because Europe, we talk about Europe, but Europe is a very <laughs> articulated animal. So the, 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 this idea that this war is, is the result of NATO expansionism, which is threatening Russia, the vital Russian interest. Even the Pope, there is this, we call it catto communismo in Italy. Catto communismo. There is there some communal value in this. And this catto communismo, we have a big, two big traditions in Italy the Christian tradition and the communist. And on some point, they, they are together, especially on the anti Americanism, anti capitalism, opposed to the imperialists, to the Americans. This culture is deeply entrenched in Italy. The liberal culture, the democratic country, is much less important, it's a minority. I tell you, I had some some effect in my work because I'm here. My only, that's why I'm so long, so much here. And why, in spite of, I try to be on, on the ground. I try to be, say, I see it. You know, in Italy, when there was the first story, the New York Times, but oh, everybody, the Bucha massacres, they were saying there was no, there were bodies, there were not, I mean, Russian propaganda, they were repeating, is not true. The journalists who are there are paid by CIA. So, I'm a, so I, I remember one day there was someone who said, so I am a CIA agent, you think I get money from CIA? Please CIA pay me because I would like to, uh, to get my salary, what are you talking about? And this is, you know, the first, my argument is one, I tell you what is my argument. Is, do you remember, the first 48 hours, the American called Zelensky, Biden called Zelensky and tell him, take out, Get out. They want to kill you. Get out. We take you to Poland, Moldavia, where, outside, and there you organize a, a government in exile. You organize your, your resistance, but you know, they want to kill you. We save you. you you're crazy to stay. Even the Americans didn't believe the, the Ukrainian uh, were not, would have resisted. And what happened? The Lenkis say no. And this changed the narrative, this changed the story. 
I will die here. The Americans were not interested in, actually they didn't want this war, because the main argument, the main problem since Barack Obama up till today for America, it's China. And for them, at the beginning, not, now it changed, but at the beginning this was a diversion for the major problem, which was Pacific Ocean, Taiwan, China, and the dictatorship there. They really want to take it out. The Americans have a lot of you know, problems, they make a lot of mistakes, but the intelligence of Russia, because of historical reasons, is quite good, as we can see. And they knew that the, American, that the Russian army is not so strong as Putin claimed. They built very well in Syria, they were able to capitalize to the weakness of the West, by the way, to French, Italy, in Libya. And they have this now, they broadcast this image of superpower, which are not at all, as you can see. This is not at all an, an American uh, uh, military op op operation. It's not a plot to attack Russia at all. But in Italy, th this war is perceived more and more like that. And this new government, not M uh, Premier Meloni, not uh, Tajani, the foreign minister at all, he was, by the way, the president of the European Parliament, is very Atlantist. But many of the important, relevant components of uh, the new, unfortunately, of the new Italian government are deeply pro-Russian. I go a lot in uh, Italian uh, journalist school, you know, also the university, there are now faculty of journalism. Go to the field. Go to the field. Don't be afraid. Stay there weeks, not days. If you go to Bakhmut, go to Bakhmut. Go sleeping in Krematorsk. Go to Bakhmut. Don't sleep in Bakhmut. <laughs> go and see around. Talk with people. Go to the ground. Stiamo camminando qui proprio dietro la piazza di Bakhmut. Si sentono spari continuamente. Più che altro sono spari. Sembra che le batterie ucraine siano piazzate. Sentite i colpi. Qua c'è, doveva esserci una, una casa che è stata colpita questa... Ah, that one. Che è stata colpita questa notte. Qui c'è una specie di parco divertimenti. Parco giochi, ci sono ancora spari, sono proiettili inesplosi, rottami. Sentite continuamente. Praticamente questo è il fronte, i russi sono qui a 2-3 km. What is the secret of the Ukrainian resistance is volunteer. This country, it's, it sounds a bit rhetorical, but it's not. It's, you know, Zelensky is not leading the people. Zelensky is the incarnation, let me use this very Catholic word, incarnation. He's the spokesman of his own people. This was a, 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 a willpower, there was a, a, a determination to resist. Which, was, which impressed me. And for me, I can finish with this sentence. This is a very good lesson for weak European democracies. It means freedom, freedom of the press, which I insist, liberty, democracy, pluralism, must be defended even with weapons. And you need people ready to die. So they, are, they have to be convinced that they are defending something which is right. And here there are people who constantly tell me, women and men, young and old, who tell me I'm willing to fight and to die. Because I've been here before. I was in, uh, a lot in Odessa. In, uh, I found people who were before not so anti-Russian at all, actually pro-Russian. Russian speaker. Uh, connected to Russian culture, they have relatives in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. They now cut with the families. The boomerang effect of this invasion was to push people 
to be anti-Russian when they were not. I like very much Odessa, but I tell you, if I will stay here, I will tell you why, but if I will stay here and I use the pretext to write a story, I want to go to the, I like mountaineering, so I will go to see the Carpazzi in winter. But Odessa because, uh, well, because it's a cause, you can feel history, you can, in, in the building, you see this flourish of uh, uh, different cultures, it's very cosmopolitan, you can see the co cosmopolitan past, uh, the beauty of the... Um, also, I tell you something. I was, as a Mediterranean, I love Mediterranean, and I was very suspicious about the Black Sea. I would consider kind of, because I've been in Istanbul a lot, and, and there is very polluted Istanbul, or the Marmaris Lake, uh, sea. While here it's quite clean, and a good fish. But I like, really, I like this air, this... Uh, um, uh, atmosphere of cosmopot of openness, of cosmopolitanism, of um, uh, pluralism. I like it very much. <laughs>